I'm sure most readers who know you and know your story assume that this has to be your story. How much is biographical? That is the question that I get asked more than any other, I have to admit. I think it's because people who have known me at some point in my life and recognize maybe an element of my own life that's in the book then go on to wonder, well, is everything in the book her life? For example, I lost my mother at a young age and so does the protagonist, Kate Monroe. And so then people think, well, did you also go on and do these things uh, in your business life? And the honest answer is that the narrative is fiction. Uh, my trading practices were never under investigation by the Federal Reserve. But I do believe the story is authentic, and I have felt all the emotions that I describe in that book. The, the emotions of the protagonist and all the other characters, though not just exactly the way they are evoked in the book. But you have to have felt them yourself in order to be able to describe them well. But I do have friends who worked with me at J.P. Morgan who say that they lined up the characters on one side and then the people who they thought uh, and you know were just connecting. And I say to them, well, connect away because you just can't dissuade them for, from looking at it. When you, when you write a memoir, everyone says you're making it up. When you write fiction, everyone says it's true. <laughs> so I'm really just happy that people are reading the book. Even though the book is set in 1985, the themes you're exploring and the, the picture you paint of Wall Street is, seems to be every bit as true today as it was then. Uh, it seems to me anybody who has an interest in the way business is done on Wall Street in America or the current financial crisis will get something out of this book. It's interesting that you say that because I have a friend who is still in the financial services industry at a senior level. And she told me, after she read my novel, everything has changed and nothing has changed. And I think by that she meant Kate has to go downstairs in the lobby to make a phone call because there were no cell phones then. But there are still people who make a lot of compromises and cut corners as they, as they do things uh, in the pursuit of, of business and profitability. I remember back in 1985, we had a bet in, in the trading room on, we were long bonds. So if the economy was bad and if unemployment rose, well then your bonds, which are interest rate driven without getting into the math of it all, bonds will go up when the economy goes down because everyone anticipates lower interest rates and then bonds with a fixed rate, they go up. And I remember we had a big bet on that the economy was worse than people thought. And when the unemployment number came out one Friday morning, it was higher, like our economists predicted. And the market rallied tremendously, and we made a lot of money. So when the number came out, there was a big cheer that went up in the trading room. And my boss later on called me into his office, and he said, I want to let you know something, that this young uh, trainee came into me this afternoon and said he wants to resign and leave because he just can't work in a business where people are cheering when more people are out of work. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, well, we'll really miss him, but not really feeling ashamed or anything about that. I thought that was just, that was just part of it, you know, it wasn't anything personal kind of thing. Uh, so it's, it's interesting, you know, how everybody evolves on this. now you know, 25 years later, I can see, and I would like to meet that young man and, and find out what he went on to do, because that seemed to be such a, a, a sign of self-knowledge on his part that he didn't want to be in something where you would be cheering for that. And so he made, a, I thought, a very uh, courageous and intelligent move to exit from that business. So, I mean, I'm not, you know, someone who just said, oh, down with Wall Street, you know. I mean, I, I, mean, I was just sort of in awe of that, and, but I didn't think we'd done anything, you know, inappropriate. If your protagonist were a neurotic, an infomaniac, or more of a bitch, the book might be easier to market. Those are, those are uh, hooks that people can sort of buy into very easily. But I think that's where it's important to remember that 
the book is set in 1985, and a woman trying to break into the extremely male-dominated world of Wall Street in the 80s could not be any of those three and ever hope to get onto the trading desk. She would have had to be non-threatening, aggressive enough to be looked at as assertive rather than aggressive, that was the word then, assertive was okay, get on there, on the desk, be successful, make money, and once you made money, people were willing to look past gender, anything. If you made money, you know, you were probably going to keep having a job there. Now I need to ask you what's next, and I hope you say a sequel. Well, that's very flattering. People have said I have left the ending open to a sequel, but that really wasn't my intention. Uh, but never say never. <laughs>